Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Professor Paul Sabin, Associate Professor of History. His research and teaching focus on energy and environmental history. Today we'll talk with Professor Sabin about his new book, The Bet, Paul Ehrlich, Julian Simon, and our gamble over Earth's future. It provides a framework for understanding today's environmental debates. Welcome, Professor Saban. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start with an overview of the book and, of course, tell us the story about the bet. Sure. Well, the, uh, the book is, uh, uses an iconic bet between the biologist Paul Ehrlich, who is the author of the uh, 1968 blockbuster The Population Bomb, mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of his main critics, uh, a man named Julian Simon, an economist. Uh, and they actually made a bet in 1980 about five metals and their prices and whether they would go up or down over the course of the next 10 years. And uh, uh, this was a proxy for their arguments about overpopulation and whether the world was headed uh, for uh, famine, uh, resource scarcity, uh, uh, war, thermonuclear war, or, uh, or disease outbreaks. And th these have been some of the predictions that Ehrlich had made. Mm -hmm. And Simon had argued, in fact, that human ingenuity and innovation would lead to uh, uh, overpopulation not, or population growth not being a, ultimately a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who won the bet? <laughs> so, si spoiler alert: uh, Simon <laughs> won the bet, and uh, and ever since people have been arguing about what this uh, what the outcome of the bet means. Uh -huh. uh, so he the the five metals they were copper, uh, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten, and they mm -hmm. declined pretty much across the board. Uh, Ehrlich ultimately sent Simon a check for five hundred and seventy six dollars. Uh, to represent his his the, the decline in value of the the bundle of metals that they mm -hmm. had uh, that they had bet on, and so the question is what does this bet bet mean? I mean right. metal prices aren't necessarily the best proxy for uh, the state of humanity or the right, environmental right. conditions. I was con I was curious uh, as to why they chose metals. I mean. You know, what is the relevancy of that? Right. Well, I mean, you, you, if you situate in the late 1970s and think about the, the, the run-up in oil prices and the oil shocks at that time, and there also was a significant increase in prices of, of metals at that time, so there, there was a lot of focus on commodities and commodity prices and the idea that there we were headed towards uh, scarcity. So there have been predictions uh, in the early 70s that we were going to run out of oil during the 1980s, mm -hmm. and uh, that turned out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so. So the, part of why I was interested in this uh, in this story uh, coming at it from an em environmental mm -hmm. history perspective was that Simon won the bet and trying to understand you know, what can we learn from mm -hmm. uh, from his victory uh, over over Ehrlich in this right, case. Right. I mean, just to expound on on what led you to write the book. I mean, so how did you, I mean is this bet well known? Um, uh, what, yeah, it has. What, it has how, become. How did you get here? <laughs> well, it, ha it has become a significant uh, touchstone, for, particularly for conservatives criticizing environmentalists over. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental regulation. Uh, actually, the Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, offers an award each year, the Julian Simon Award for uh, for innovators, uh, for, for people who focus on uh, hum, uh, human innovation, and the and the award trophy is a leaf that has the five medals uh, that were uh -huh. from the bet. So uh -huh. I guess it's sort of symbolic of how uh, Simon's right. victory has been a touchstone. Um, and, so, and so it's seen that uh, if uh, that these predictions of population growth were were perhaps mistaken, then that also means that various other kinds of environmental concerns also maybe are are okay. mistaken. That's that's been the argument. Right. You must, um, in in terms of writing this book book, you know, looked back and have seen some predictions um, back in the day that were made that didn't necessarily pan out. Right. Was there anything that was particularly surprising to you? Well, I, I, I was surprised in, in so, to see how widely held some of these predictions were about that we were going to run out of oil or in the late 60s, this tremendous fears of worldwide famine that right. was, was about to strike the planet. And uh, and then some of the some of the claims that were made based on that also were were striking. As there was a book that was published in the late '60s called Famine 1975 that argued that there was going to be worldwide famines as a result of uh, overpopulation and food mm -hmm. shortages, and uh, and therefore we should practice triage. Uh, and some some uh, countries were were seen as being kind of beyond the pale, unsavable, and that we should cut them off from oh food aid. Goodness. And uh, so some of some of the arguments were pretty extreme in terms uh -huh. of what we needed to do to avoid right, the right. future crises. It must have been somewhat amusing, too, to have read some of them. I would imagine. Well, it, it is. It is interesting to to see these predictions and 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 how uh, they haven't turned out right, right. Uh, as as expected. I mean, so my book is called the bet because of this little bit, but mm -hmm. it's also uh, another meaning of the title is that we're all engaged in the bet today about right. the future, and so some of these predictions haven't come true to date. Uh, but it doesn't mean that. Uh, 
difficult times or mm -hmm. major challenges won't face us in the future. Right, so I right. guess many of these issues aren't entirely resolved. So um, what do we face in the future? Well, I'm most interested in the debate over climate change right mm -hmm. now and seeing uh, how that's unfolding. And one of the things that I think is interesting about this earlier story about population growth and resource scarcity is how the debate today over climate change is kind of stuck in ruts uh, that were established by the earlier fight between Simon and Ehrlich and, and their allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you see today uh, accusations of alarmism about, uh, about uh, uh, on, on one side and great skepticism about science uh, by, by many conservatives and part of that is drawn from their previous criticisms mm -hmm. over po uh, about population growth and resource scarcity. Mm -hmm. Now those things didn't turn out the way that was expected but I think climate change in fact is happening and is a grave concern right, right. and it's really unfortunate that we're stuck in these, uh, these long-standing uh, ruts. Uh, yeah, I mean I have read that pre pretty much most scientists will agree that there is climate change going on, that yes, it is happening. Definitely. So um, do you argue in your book something along the lines of how to, um, you know, what we need to do? Well, I mean, the, the argument of the book is, is one that we need to uh, recognize how these two extreme perspectives in, in some ways produced each other mm -hmm. uh, and, and, that, and that also we need to figure out what can we learn from both sides. So mm -hmm. I guess I, I see that both Ehrlich's perspective and Simon's arguments have important insights to share. Ehrlich's, what are they, yes? Yeah. So Ehrlich's on, uh, on the way that humans are transforming the planet, the tremendous impact that we have, many of the biological changes that are unfolding, but Simon's about uh, the adaptability of human society, of flexibility of human economies, mm -hmm. uh, the role of innovation and technology and science, all of those things that, uh, that, that mean that we aren't on a straight line, I guess, from abundance to scarcity, as mm -hmm. many people who are predicting we were going to run out of various resources, sure. they said we were going to go you know, from abundant oil all of a sudden to scarcity, but in fact, it's really a history of boom and bust over, over, over the, actually the whole history mm -hmm. of the oil economy. And, uh, and so I guess learning from both sides, uh, in, I think that's one of the essential points. Um, in terms of learning from Julian Simon's point of view, he argued that problems uh, often led to solutions that ultimately led us better off. And my own view about the climate uh, story is that uh, it's only by recognizing that climate change is a problem that we can unleash the solutions that Julian Simon uh, celebrated. And so one of the problems that we face right now is that in, in the reluctance to recognize that climate change is a problem, uh, many of Simon's ally, intellectual allies are in some ways undermining the very kinds of solutions that Simon uh, mm -hmm. celebrated. Well, wouldn't, couldn't one argue that there are certain people who recognize that there's climate change, but the people who don't want to recognize it have a financial gain? So that's mm -hmm. part of the problem, isn't sure. it? Well, it, it is true that there are uh, powerful financial interests actually on all sides of, mm -hmm. of this uh, of this story, uh, I mean, and but my uh, my book is more about the intellectual battle uh, okay. and and recognizing actually that there are important insights on both sides. It's not just a uh, financial fight. I mean, there is, there is that is very important. The the oil oil fossil fuel industries mm -hmm. are very powerful and have deep vested interests in in sustaining right. the fossil fuel economy. Uh, but at the same time, the whole uh, debate is actually embedded in this larger. Uh, clash over how we think about the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you think we should think about the future? Well, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, mm -hmm. about, the, about the future, recognizing that we have major challenges ahead, but that uh, I think if we, uh, if, we, if we take the steps necessary to address them, we can overcome them. And with the case of climate change, the major, the major steps would be uh, bringing, bringing climate into the, into the marketplace, actually, to the extent uh, through, through carbon taxes or through kind of regulatory systems like cap and trade, but that there be some way uh, to uh, put the power of uh, human innovation and, and markets to bear on the, on the carbon uh, dioxide, mm -hmm. uh, the climate problem. Uh, and that really what the, the problem we have right now is that it's, it's sort of free-floating outside of the marketplace and there's no way to bring uh, our, the, the powerful forces we have to bear uh, on solving it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wonder, is there going to be a point of no return where everyone keeps talking, talking, talking and not doing anything and then it becomes too late? Mm -hmm. And then I think about population at being at, what, 7 billion now? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many more people can the right. Earth carry? Right. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think that there's really a, a distinction between population growth and climate change are, are mm -hmm. somewhat different because climate change produces uh, a, a kind of uh, 
environmental outcomes, rising sea levels, uh, mm -hmm. acidification of the ocean. They're, they're very, uh, it's likely linked to ex more extreme weather. There, there are specific things that come. Whereas I think population growth is um, kind of uh, results in the kind of di different kinds of di diffuse pressures that are uh, uh, felt by the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so there are many different ways to solve uh, the problems that are the challenges that population growth mm -hmm. poses. So I don't think that we're going to run to the point where one more person or a certain number of people are going to lead us over the cliff mm -hmm. on population. Okay. But I think in climate, actually, it is more, uh, that's a little less clear uh, in terms of how that's going to unfold. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are possibly tipping points with the climate. Uh, and we don't entirely understand the, the climate system and how, how it will uh, develop. And so that's, those are the kinds of risks and uncertainties mm -hmm. that, that the kind of bet that we're, we're making right now that right. we need to address. So how do we address it? I mean, what's the first step? Well, like as I was saying, I, th I think it's really about uh, putting a price on carbon, on trying to bring the the, the problems associated with the uh, with global warming uh, into the into a, a market framework where uh, we can be bringing the, the kind of forces to bear on solving them. Uh, that mm -hmm. the kind of innovation that Julian Simon celebrated will only happen if uh, we can create the proper incentives for people to be innovating and taking action. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really about a partnership between government uh, and uh, and the marketplace, and that the marketplace needs to be structured in a way that it, it, it kind of furthers the values that we have mm -hmm. about the kind of society we want to live in. Well, hopefully that will happen <laughs> sooner rather than I later. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> so I'm cautiously optimistic, but there are a lot of reasons not to be, too. Okay. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thanks so much for having me. For more information about Professor Sabin and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.